This is the bird flu briefing uh, from University of Illinois Extension, and glad to have you here. Um, who we've got online uh, today for this discussion uh, is Dr. Ken Kolkebeck, and Ken is our uh, state poultry specialist. Most of you, as, as uh, people interested in the poultry industry in Illinois, probably know uh, Dr. Kolkebeck's name already, so we'll get to him in a minute. Uh, also attending, a colleague of mine, a small farms local food educator and a poultry producer himself, is uh, Andy Larson. Andy's from the northern part of the state here, and you'll hear from Andy in a little bit. Hello, My name's Scott. My name is Kyle Cecil. I'm a small farms educator with Extension, and we've got a number of uh, uh, technical people that are helping out here. Too many to mention, but thanks for their help on there today. So what we're going to try to do today is we've got a lot of people online, and, and because of that, um, we're not really able to open this up to questions. What we did uh, with working with Dr. Kolkebeck and a number of, of different people is we've kind of got a, a, a question-answer type briefing here that I'll ask the questions and uh, Dr. Kolkebeck and, and Andy will help us work through to get some information. Our goal is not to answer every question out there about the situation with bird flu right now, but what we want to do is answer the top ones for you and bring everybody up to speed. So that's a pretty good description when you say Ken does that work that's correct yes okay so with that um, uh, we're gonna get started here and and Ken can you talk to our, our group a little bit about just what exactly are we dealing with and what is this avian uh, influenza okay well pre again appreciate everybody uh, coming into the webinar discussion on this topic it's uh, it's a topic that's uh, of on the front of everybody's mind in uh, small flock, uh, commercial, uh, layers, turkeys, uh, you name it. And we probably should have had this a couple months ago. But um, so basically, I wanted to kind of tell you, you know, what we're dealing with and what is it um, to kind of set the stage for a few other follow up points. So um, AI, uh, we call it avian influenza, and the media kind of calls it bird flu. Um, it's a disease that affects all poultry, um, chickens, turkeys, pheasants, quail, um, ducks, and geese. The caveat in there is that when it affects uh, ducks and geese, they don't show any uh, really symptoms. Um, and in fact, they become the carrier of the virus that uh, eventually will affect uh, you know, domestic poultry. Um, Besides ducks and geese, any shorebirds would also um, carry the virus. Um, and they would shed that virus into the environment. And of course, they often don't show any signs of illness. Uh, now, what we're dealing with here since December 15th of last year, 2014, is a very um, severe and what we call high path avian influenza and HPAI for short. And um, we call it high path because uh, when it affects chickens and turkeys, uh, it's very devastating to the flock in general. As a matter of fact, uh, once a flock contracts HPAI, 70% um, of the birds will die within about three days. And so by the time either the commercial industry or uh, small flock people figure out what's going on, you know, three quarters of your birds are dead. And so, um, and it's very dangerous, uh, very, you know, dangerous and um, pathologically uh, very serious. So um, th that's what we're dealing with right now. Um, and uh, I'll elaborate a little more on um, the specificity of, of the virus. Um, so basically in chickens, um, you know, there's a combination. It shows flu-like chick uh, symptoms. Uh, the birds will gasp for air. Um, sometimes there's diarrhea involved. Um, there's swelling around the, the head, the neck, the eyes. Uh, purple discoloration around the head and the legs. Um, now, sometimes their nervous system is affected, and it may look like the birds actually have Merrick's disease, which is a nervous disorder, um, but the birds will have tremors, um, twisted necks, uh, paralyzed wings, um, and so forth. And so it's it's high path, in other words, when the birds get it, um, 
and basically there is a uh, onset of high degree of uh, mortality uh, occurring. So to further on that, um, December of 2014, we had the first case of uh, that was reported to the USDA uh, division. Um, and it was a subtype which was called H5N2. Um, now briefly, uh, there are, there can be numerous combinations of what we call um, avian influenza or bird flu, okay? And um, these combinations, there can be around um, over 200 combinations of the uh, the glycoproteins that cause the uh, the virus to recombine and actually produce what is called, you know, a high path. So uh, the H stands for hemagglutinate hemagglutinin um, protein. It's a glycoprotein, and the N stands for neuraminidase. Um, and so there are approximately eight, 16 types of H types and nine of n and so when you multiply that out there's about 144 combinations and so what we have going on right now is uh the h5n2 and it's uh essentially uh high path um and so um the first case was in um oregon i believe um and ironically it started out in a backyard flock there were mixed birds in this backyard flock, about 30 of them. Um, now that virus was typed as H5N8, okay? Uh, but quickly after that, um, there were flocks that were identified with H5N2, okay? And um, so once we got the first case in Oregon in late 2014, other Western states um, reported outbreaks of the subtype H5N2. Washington, California, Idaho, um, some commercial flocks in California. Um, and so um, that's kind of what it, where it started. Um, then we started to see outbreaks, uh, at least in, in backyard and in uh, commercial turkey flocks in the state of Minnesota. Uh, Missouri and Arkansas okay and so the first outbreaks were um, Minnesota commercial turkeys uh, H5N2 and 26,000 birds were affected okay and so um, then Missouri Arkansas Kansas South Dakota Montana um, North Dakota and Wisconsin um, had outbreaks occurring from January through April Okay, and so um, most of these outbreaks, at least in the commercial industry, were in a commercial turkey industry. Um, uh, but early on, there were incidences of it occurring in backyard flocks. Um, and so then uh, in Iowa, um, so, so, so far it didn't um, affect commercial egg layers. In Iowa on April 20th, we got a confirmation, at least the USDA got a confirmation of there were 3.8 million hens that were infected with H5N2 uh, on a complex. And essentially those birds had to be depopulated by USDA. Um, and most recently, as of yesterday, there was a, um, about 5.5 million layers in Iowa that were affected and have to be depopulated. And nationwide, at least in the commercial industry, there's been 11, bir 11 million birds uh, depopulated in the lair in the turkey industry. So um, just a little bit more on statistics, and then we'll go and, and talk a little bit about how the virus spreads. Um, so April 22nd, we have um, 58 commercial farms. And so, you know, since a lot of you are out there um, interested in, in backyard and small flocks, uh, only 10 backyard flocks and small farms, um, about 2.7 million turkeys on 44 farms, and now probably up to about five egg production farms. Um, 
And so uh, the indication of and the way it's transferred is um, it's motor transmission are various types, but commercial are but waterfowl, ducks and geese seem to carry the virus. And um, then, of course, then the virus gets into these turkey and layer buildings and, uh, you know, birds contract the disease and it affects them very seriously. So the operation on the West Coast, we figured that um, it occurred by birds um, in, in the Pacific flyway. And then when we got confirmation of H5N2 in Minnesota, that was birds that actually, um, you know, they overwinter down in South America um, and they co-mingle, uh, ducks and geese co-mingle, and then they carry the virus back up when they come up here for the summertime and uh, so the, the birds, commercial birds that were affected in Minnesota occurred, actually got the disease from waterfowl carrying it back up, uh, depositing their feces near, near buildings, and uh, then, then flocks actually um, started to get uh, problems with H5N2. And so. can the migratory waterfowl, you know, the, the distance that they can travel in a day's time, that's what makes this uh the the spread of this this type of uh um uh disease that much more you know readily available in these flyways correct exactly correct correct and um it's still amazing to me how it gets into commercial operations i, I could see if you have a backyard flock and and you have uh you know ducks and geese without around within a couple of miles and a reservoir like a pond i could see where possibly that might be an easier transmission for that black yard flock. But how it gets into the commercial operation is because they practice and practice and practice biosecurity. Um, and it's just, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of uh, mind boggling to think that that could even happen. Um, but the, so the virus, you know, the virus basically spreads um, bird to bird contact, okay? Um, and human to bird contact via what we call horizontal transmission, uh, which so the virus can live in the manure, in the dust, in the feathers, on the equipment, feed trucks, uh, you name it. Um, there is less likely a, an incidence of the um, virus actually uh, traveling through the air, although um, if conditions are cool and moist, and uh, it could spread from house to house, at least in a commercial operation. So viruses can survive about um, 35 or more days in manure, soil, and water. And uh, this virus can also survive three months or more in cold weather. Now, um, in my conversations with Dr. Rob Porter, who's helped us out quite a bit on a lot of this information, as of yesterday said, the virus can survive uh, 30 days or so in temperatures of 70 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. So uh, we're hoping that we're at the tail end of this problem. Um, however, the, uh, s some of the USDA people think that it will resurface in the fall when temperatures get cool and the, bird, the at least the waterfowl start to uh, gather together and start their migration down south and they leave the virus behind before they go down south. And so um, that's what we're kind of facing here going forward in the fall. So likely, Dr. Kolkebeck, we'll be talking about this and dealing with it in some form or fashion for an extended period of time. This is probably isn't something we're going to deal with for 30 days here. More likely, we'll be diligent about this for a number of years. Is that a correct statement? Yeah, yeah. And as, in my conversation with Dr. Porter yesterday, he said that um, uh, this is something that's, you know, not just this, this, uh, this winter and this spring. But I think in his mind, he's a veterinarian and I'm not actually. So his, his mind thinks that we're going to be dealing with this with three or four more years, maybe in five years or so. so um, the better so educated we are, the, the better we'll be able to handle it. Exactly right. Yeah. 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 So 
um, one of the first things that comes to mind and you get a lot of questions about is, um, you know, with this, this, this situation in poultry, are, are, are poultry and eggs then safe to eat? Are we okay with consuming those food products? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I've, I've actually received some questions, too, in regards to that. Um, from, from our sources is that the, the risk to the public is very low. And um, uh, the, as, as a matter of fact, if people do cook meat properly, uh, make sure that internal temperature is up to about 165 or so, and cook eggs properly, that um, there should be no reason to suspect that uh, people are going to get sick from eating poultry products and eggs. And so, um, and that's good news for the public. Um, and so, so far, this H5N2 variant of the, of the virus has, um, you know, it's a, it's a bird problem right now. And um, thinking back a little bit to the H5N1 outbreak in Southeast Asia, where people did die, unfortunately, uh, with that strain. Um, and this is, this is a different, di different combination. Um, and so, uh, of course, people died over there because they they would keep they would be very close to their birds. They would eat in the I'm house, they would sleep in the quiet. house, and so um, we practice better biosecurity here in the United States. And so, um, what we have now is not the H5N1 uh, combination. Uh, it's H5N2, and it seems to be limited to being just a bird problem only. So the, the normal recommendation we would always have is just good food safety, good food handling practices, cook cook the uh, food to proper temperature, and we should be okay there. Yes, yeah, that's our current thinking at the moment, yes. So with a lot of the growers that we have, producers that we have online here today, um, can you talk a little bit more about what specifically they should be looking for in these birds and, and, and talk us through, walk us through that? Great, okay, yeah. Um, of course, uh, what you need to, to realize that um, uh, you're always, when you go out and check your birds in the morning and the evening, you're always going to look for any sick birds that you have, okay? And, um, of course, with this disease, if something, if, if you get an outbreak, um, you know, a couple, two or three days, and you might lose all the birds, or nearly all the birds. So, uh, what happens is, first, um, laying hens particularly, what they first do is, drop in egg production. They will quit laying eggs. Just just stop. And um, birds will not eat. They have lower appetite. Um, and so you would have decreased egg production. Um, and similar to Newcastle bronchitis, uh, a producer would look for any soft-shelled eggs, misshapen eggs that the hens are still laying and producing. Um, and then on further examination of the birds themselves, uh, Producers should look for and be aware of any um, swelling in the head, the eyelids, the comb, the waddles, the hocks. Of course, there are numerous respiratory diseases in poultry, and they all kind of look the same. Okay, uh, so it's um, it's kind of deceiving as to figure out what it is. Okay, uh, another thing that they can look for is purple discoloration in the waddles, the combs, the legs. Um, runny noses, sneezing, coughing, um, and then of course if they are having trouble walking um, or having diarrhea, um, that's an indication too that there's something more than just a, uh, a little bout of, um, of coryza or something else going, or, new, or bronchitis going through the flock. And typically, typically what happens is that um, you, know, you just have sudden mortality sudden death without clinical uh, signs. And so if you come in, if you have 30 birds and you have uh, 10 of them are dead one morning, um, you need to suspect that something serious is going on. And so, um, and you don't necessarily have to see those, uh, those, those uh, descriptions that I just went over, um, but you'd have a lot of birds dying. Um, 
I think that's one of the things that, you know, a small flock or backyard uh, producer, it, they see their animals so much that, um, you know, and, and a lot of experience out there uh, with growing these birds. You know when, when the birds are off, when they're sick, when production is down. So the key to it is just to make sure that you're continuing that diligence. And when you start to see something happen that, you, you know, you're even that much more diligence. Because, as you said, it can happen very quickly that you can go from, from bad, bad to worse. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, daily check, um, daily check of the birds is, is real important. And, uh, when you're with them every day, you notice those things, you listen, you listen for any, uh, and look for any abnormal activity. And, um, with HPAI, the high path, even influenza, um, and of course you'll, you'll see mortality quickly. And, you know, with bronchitis, you might see some soft-shelled eggs. You might see hear some coughing and sneezing going on, which is not HPAI. And of course, they won't die that readily with uh, bronchitis um, or even coryza, um, as they do with the high path avian influenza. So uh, you have to look for different things and actual, um, you know, swelling of the head and the things that I mentioned uh, closer. But I think it's uh, it's time that, that um, you know, uh, due diligence and uh, look at your birds very closely um, and beware of any changes in what's going on. Okay, so let's talk, and I think both Andy and, and you or Dr. Kolkebeck are going to cover this next part a little bit. So we've covered some basics on it, then we begin to talk about the very practical side of that from, you know, an individual flock. So could, could both of you, and we'll take turns here, can you talk a little bit about how to limit the risk uh, of this disease to, to the individual flocks that we have? Yeah, Andy, do you want to speak a little bit on that? Sure thing. Um, at this point, so especially for the backyard producers, there's a couple of good things that um, Ken has laid out and that uh, I've laid out in some previous publications that we've done. It's essentially you got to really think about biosecurity. It sounds like one of those words that only pertains to the big guys. You know, I, you've seen all the folks with the, you know, the ET suits walking through foot baths, showering in and out of livestock. I mean, you don't necessarily have to go to that degree, but the principles are the same. Um, you really do have to think about biosecurity even for small flocks and you got to think about a plan for your specific operation. So since a lot of this high path avian influenza is coming from wild birds, especially the migratory waterfowl, one of the best things that you can do is keep a, uh, a an obvious physical segregation and separation from any um, water or soil that has been in contact with those uh, kind of migratory waterfowl. Uh, you don't want to let them use surface water that ducks and geese tend to drink and swim and everything in. Uh, you keep your domestic poultry away from those things. If you are in an area where those type of birds fly over a lot and could be depositing manure over the flight, um, it's probably best to keep your domestic poultry off of those uh, pastures or day range areas until temperatures are in the 70s and above uh, for the most part in order to sort of deactivate that um, HPAI virus. Um, be really, really, really careful about visiting other premises with poultry on them. Um, I know that there's sort of interesting and fun you know they do the sort of garden walk style where you do a chicken coop walk and go from place to place seeing one flock and they're set up and seeing another flock and they're set up this is not the best time to have one of those kinds of get-togethers right. um, if you're going to be moving from uh, one flock location to another do it in the middle of the summer when it's nice and hot and most of this HPAI should have at least temporarily died down but even when you're doing that think about disinfecting uh, footwear and things like that when you go from one poultry situation into the other um, if you do have pastured poultry you, you're facing the same kind of decision that I'm and me and my wife are facing right now. Do you keep them confined indoors 
until the sort of um, extreme component of this outbreak has passed. And, and that's going to be a personal decision. I think that the best information is saying that, yes, you should have your birds indoors until uh, temperatures grow up, migratory waterfowl are done moving around. Um, that, that's really the ideal situation from a biosecurity standpoint. OK, Ken, what have I missed? Uh I hit the, you've hit the high points, and um, uh, you know another thing would be um, uh, limit limit uh, I guess bird bird movement to other uh, places. Um, I guess I, I am really I'm really kind of worried about since the virus started in backyard flock on the west coast. I'm worried about the backyard. Uh, and, and you know the people that want to raise a few chickens in the backyard, um, because um, you know they they don't know as much about biosecurity as uh, the certainly the, the the big guys, big commercial guys, and so um, it's dangerous to say you know uh, have two people say oh come over and visit my birds and I'll come over and visit your birds. That's not what you want to do, and so I think I'm just reiterating what you had said, Andy, about that. Um, and so movement of birds, uh, manure equipment, uh, people, um, keep it to a minimum. And um, like Andy mentioned, I think uh, need to develop a good biosecurity plan um, and, and uh, kind of watch out for waterfowl near your premise. Um, you know, don't use the, don't use the water from the the pond or stream water for drinking water um, and keep your feed bunk bins covered um, you know there's there's a whole host of things that you can do to try to you know limit exposure try not to have feed attracting birds um, and uh, keep the birds in the of course well, those with pasture poultry um, you know the kind of it's kind of a marketing thing do you let your birds out it, it damage your your uh, your marketing objectives, um, and and so you have to decide that on your own. Um, clothing that you wear to uh, take care of the birds, um, make sure it's clean. Uh, even go as far as ordering Tyvek suits on and plastic boots, disposable, um, back and forth when you're uh, taking care of the birds, um, just to avoid contaminating uh, and, and spreading it around um, and of course uh, limit uh, limiting vi visitors and uh, I think Andy you had gone on and uh, uh, got some examples of signs that you could put up in front of your property yep you might want to elaborate a little bit on that uh, it's a it's a pretty simple situation I mean there's a lot of sort of pre-made signs out there even have one if you want to contact me for an actual template of a sign but basically just say biosecurity please uh, if you've been in contact with other livestock or poultry operations call these numbers before entering the premises and that is something that you can post up either at the end of your driveway or you know if your residence is in um, separate from your poultry rearing area then you can just place it in front of the, the the poultry area but the idea there is to make people think twice about you know whether or not they've been in contact with a situation where they could potentially spread something to your flock um, it doesn't have to be complex it doesn't have to be overly intimidating necessarily it's just like call us first and so the person who's coming and delivering feed the person who has been at another poultry flock the person who is a service provider to poultry operations whatever all those people should be um, give, giving second thoughts about whether or not to go on to an additional poultry operation without uh, the proper precautions. If you do have somebody that's coming in from another uh, poultry operation, it is really good practice to do um, disinfection of the vehicle tires and maybe the underside of the vehicle if you can get at it. Also the um, the footwear of the, the driver of the vehicle. Those are very uh, common uh, 
uh, vector areas for some of the transmissible um, pathogens that can come along in, in, in poultry operations. Another thing just to add on to uh, Ken's discussion regarding uh, footwear and clothing and everything like that, go from when you're doing your chores at your poultry operation, for example, if you've got two flocks, um, one is, you know, you've had forever and they're, a they're bird flu free and then there's some new ones that you're bringing on as replacements and they're in quarantine. Go from the situation that is the most, or excuse me, the least likely to have any kind of pathogen load to the area that is more likely to have pathogen load. And then do a thorough scrubbing and disinfecting of your footwear. So do things in the appropriate order and make sure to uh, disinfect any kind of equipment, hand tools, feeders, waters, things like that that are moving from an old flock to a new flock or from one flock to the other. And Andy's working us into something we're going to spend a little more time on here in a minute is, is, um, is, is what do you do if, you, if it's confirmed on your farm, what do you do? And we'll talk a little bit more about some disinfecting uh, uh, techniques and what have you. Um, but uh, Ken, can we come back to you now and, and can you talk to us a little more about, you know, what, so I say I'm a backyard producer and I suspect that I'm seeing these symptoms that you've been describing. What, what do I need to do at that point? Okay. Um, yeah, uh, that, that's a good point. Um, so if, if you see higher mortality, if you see some of the symptoms that we've described before, um, what you need to do immediately is to uh, try to find a local veterinarian. I know that's difficult in Illinois because there's not a lot of uh, veterinarians that are out there that are um, expertise in birds. Um, but you could also call your local extension office and get the ball rolling really quickly as far as, uh, you know, what's going on. And um, what the veterinarian would do or the extension office would do would call the Department of Agriculture in Springfield and um, uh, get the ball rolling as far as, okay, we need to look at this problem. And I'll give you that number here online uh, on the air. It's uh, 217. 782-4944. That's 217-782-4944. Uh, there's a toll-free number, which is 866-299-9256. Um, and so uh, what the department will do, will, will, uh, there, are two, there are two labs that can actually type uh, this type of virus, and um, they will contact our U of I College of Vet and Medicine, and the state lab is in Galesburg, um, and they will tell you the contact numbers for the Galesburg uh, laboratory. Um, it's also a good idea to maybe then uh, call our vet medicine uh, lab directly here in Champaign, and that's 217-333- 1620, and that's the Small Animal Diagnostic Lab. Uh, so um, if you suspect anything like this is going on, you need to start making your, your phone calls. Um, and essentially what happens is that, um, you know, if, if uh, what will happen is that the attending veterinarian would uh, take swab samples in, of the trachea, um, and they basically will uh, send them to U of I Diagnostic Lab and or Galesburg. Um, they will do further what's called a PCR test, but it's a test to actually determine whether the flock has HPAI. And then at that point, they will actually send samples to the National Veterinarian Service Lab in Ames, Iowa. And uh, they will further type that out to make sure uh, Hopefully it's not, uh, but if it's H H5N2, high path, um, then it gets reported to USDA APHIS. Um, and at that point, um, things like quarantine of, of the area around your property starts. And so this process would take about four to seven days uh, to occur. And um, at that point, then, um, you know, the USDA comes in and says, okay, uh, we found this, and 
we need to depopulate um, the birds in your property. And so the healthy birds that remain, uh, that don't show any size, but the whole flock has been determined to have HPAI, um, they are euthanized um, and, and, and disposed of in some fashion, depopulate in some fashion. And it's my understanding that the USDA will provide indemnity for the birds that remain, not the birds that had died because of the disease. And, and um, then that would be uh, st start happening. Um, it will take about a month, month and a half uh, to go through the whole process and to have them declare your property and, and release your property to where you can put birds on it again. And so the reason why the USDA comes in is because it's a reportable disease, uh, very serious, and they don't want it, they want to contain it. Uh, and so they would come in and do that. Um, and then, um, so then you'd have to go through the steps that they recommend. So certainly, you know, we want to make sure that everybody knows that, that working with, you know, the state labs and USDA, um, everybody is here to, to, to do what's, you know, the best practice for dealing with this issue and keep it at a, a minimal loss to everybody involved. So I, I want to make sure everyone understands that you should have no fear whatsoever in contacting, you know, these these agencies to assist with this. That's what they're there for, and, and, and they do these types of things so we, that, that we hopefully minimize the risk uh, and, and the loss associated with these diseases. Yeah, that's that's true. So um, I wanted to backtrack just to, just briefly here and talk about poultry shows uh, slash swap meets, um, and uh, had several calls of some of our extension offices calling in. Should we be concerned? Well, I think everybody right now is concerned, um, and just be diligent on um, like like taking birds to the show um, is is okay. Um, uh, bring your birds back, but you might want to take them in disposable uh, coops or egg cases or something. Maybe not. And if you bring your own back, um, make sure you wash it out really, really good before um, you know bring back from a show. Uh, the swap meets, frankly, they scare me <laughs> because um, every kind of bird is there, and even waterfowl are there, and so. Um, that's going to be that's that's a, a a problem that of course we can't stop those but have to be diligent on um, making sure that that uh, you know uh, we try to watch our p's and q's in regards to those uh, two activities. So Ken, let's talk a little bit, and I, I think we'll bring Andy back in the discussion here uh, real quickly on some cleanup and disinfecting. Uh, strategies. Can can you talk about? You mentioned depopulation. Can you talk about that a little bit and about how that works if it is confirmed? Of course, we're talking about you know going through the whole process and confirming we have it. This is at the at the uh, right end of the spectrum once we've determined we have the disease. But can you talk a little bit about depopulation? Yeah, yeah. Um, there are uh, several me uh, methods of of doing this um, uh, on your farm and. Um, uh, one and it's a it's a humanely approved. One is uh, what's called cervical dislocation, and uh, I think I think most people know how to do that. Um, and it's it's uh, humanely approved um, by the vet association. Um, another method is to uh, place the birds into your container of carbon dioxide. Which okay okay that be might be hard to get a hold of some of that. Um, but uh, I have heard people actually um, would hook, uh, put birds in a bag or a box and basically hook it up to the exhaust pipe of a car. Um, and then they would breathe carbon monoxide and um, be euthanized uh, that way. So those couple of methods are humanely considered uh, treatment. And um, I think that if your flock has been diagnosed as HPAI, uh, USDA will come in there and uh, assist you in doing uh, what, one of those couple of methods. Um, and in talking to Rob Porter, I wanted to interject here that uh, some of the turkey farms that have been depopulated in Minnesota, um, they have used uh, to depopulate, you know, a house of 
20,000 birds or so, they have used what is called a fire foam. It's uh, actually when firefighters, uh, besides water, uh, there is a system that has developed a, a, a foaming agent. Um, and what they do, they go in there and with the birds in there still, um, they would go in there and fill the floor of the building with this fire foam. Um, and this would asphyxiate the birds inside the building. Now, uh, after that's done, uh, the carcasses that are in there, they actually then are composting those along with the litter inside the house. And uh, they keep it within the house. Um, and then they uh, basically, once the compost is uh, process has, has been done, which takes about a month, um, and the, uh, the compost and the, the carcasses have been composted, uh, then that is determined to, they take tests on it, and then it's determined it's okay to spread it on fields. And so um, this is kind of what happens, at least in the commercial industry. Now, so then, you know, the couple of methods that I, methods that I mentioned would be applicable for a producer with a, a smaller number of birds. And so... Um, uh, Andy, if you have anything to add on that, otherwise maybe you can talk on, uh, you know, after that, then go through dis disinfecting the premises. Okay, and I apologize to those folks who are out there who, you know, the, the backyard flocks and the birds are your pets and everything like that. I mean, you really, it, this sounds ugly and it sounds unpleasant, and it is, but... Um, in a situation where you have this kind of a pathogen in your flock, your flock is going to be, um, it's going to be dead anyway. And the the cervical disarticulation, the, the breaking of the neck, uh, it can be done appropriately as well so that it is as humane as possible. Um, so there's even videos on YouTube on how to do that if you want to um, see a visual demonstration. But holding the bird's body with one hand, the other hand behind the head, and um, pulling firmly in order to separate the brainstem and the carotid arteries from the actual brain and blood supply. So that's, that's the way to get it done. There is going to be some flapping, but the bird is rendered insensible. It's not going to feel pain, and it is going to, um, it is going to die in the course of uh, one to two minutes. Okay, so clean up. Um, you've got your birds taken care of. They have been um, composted, buried, or otherwise disposed of. How can you get your poultry set up into a situation where it can house birds again? Because you're probably going to want to start over. Um, in that situation, there's sort of a multi-step cleanup and disinfectant type of practice that pretty much everybody should follow. Uh, in the case of a virus. The, so the three steps are kind of dry cleanup, wet cleanup, and disinfection. Dry cleanup just meaning the removal of dry materials, dry manure, thing like that. Wet cleanup being using a, a, a detergent and soap and water uh, to do a, a cleanup of the equipment and the premises, and then uh, disinfection. In this particular situation where we don't they're not positive whether or not this virus is being um, aerosolized, basically moving by air and wind. Um, so they're not recommending any kind of dry cleanup procedures that would create a lot of dust that might be harboring the pathogen. So a lot of like wire brushing, for example, is probably not going to be uh, recommended because then there there is concern that the pathogen can be transported on air currents in that um, aerosolized form. Not sure about that, but one way or another, better safe than sorry. So in this situation, you're going to want to really focus on the wet cleaning and the disinfecting. Um, You'll want to remove every piece of equipment out of your poultry setup as you possibly can, whether that be feeders, waterers, roosting bars, nest boxes, um, whatever else. And you do a nice, thorough soap and water cleanup of all of those things. You scrape off any kind of excessive organic material, manure, um, things like that. Uh, do a soap and water cleanup 
and then um, let it dry thoroughly and then do a disinfection process and I'll, I'll talk about some some disinfectants that you can use as far as your actual coop or your actual run that type of area um, remove as much of the the dust this the the litter the manure all of those things that are sort of on the floor and anything that may be adhering to the walls um, get that cleaned out as much as you possibly can and um, do a soap and water clean up of the of the premises um, <coughs> excuse me do the soap and water cleanup let that dry thoroughly and then do a disinfection step with one of the recommended disinfectant um, products after that you'll let everything dry down very thoroughly uh, natural air warm air warm temperatures and sunlight are all very effective uh, natural disinfecting agents so those are all uh, really good things that you could expose your 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 situation to now <coughs> pardon me as far as disinfection is incurred there there there's a lot of options out there for disinfectants um, the most common that most people in the the backyard and small flock type of situation are going to have at their disposal is bleach okay uh, you can use bleach as a very effective disinfectant um, it denatures proteins thereby rendering all those pathogens ineffective and dead um, it's inexpensive it's a very broad spectrum <coughs> and it doesn't require a very long contact time the problem with bleach is that it is going to be uh, inactivated by the presence of organic materials dirt dust manure etc all of those things are going to be uh, kind of diluting the effectiveness of the bleach disinfectant. Uh, the other sort of minimal downside is that it can be a little bit corrosive to metal materials if you're using a lot of metal equipment and you want to be very sure never to mix it with um, an acid of any sort because if you mix bleach with an acid there will be chlorine gas uh, released. So uh, that's kind of the simplest, cheapest, most readily available uh, disinfectant that the average household is going to have on hand. The second sort of really easy to use um, minimal side effect type of stuff that you can find in a lot of stores and farm stores and I'm sorry I keep coughing you all I'm muting myself for that reason. Um, <clears throat> the second most common is going to be your iodine compounds really easy to come across very minimal in terms of side effects or precautions it isn't as broadly effective as your bleach solution is going to be <clears throat> uh, so it, it's it's still going to be good but it might not be perfect it is um, just like bleach and that it is going to require relatively frequent application to maintain that sort of disinfected um, scenario um, the other big thing about iodine compounds is that it's iodine, uh, usually iota 4, something iodine and something else to make it readily mixable, and that is going to be staining. If you're looking for something that's going to be sort of the <coughs> industry gold standard as far as disinfecting agents that have very broad effect, um, effectiveness even in the presence of a lot of organic materials like dirt and feces and everything else you're probably going to be looking primarily at the oxidizing agents or the phenols <clears throat> and when I say an oxidizing agent we're talking hydrogen peroxide parasitic acid some of those things uh, you might have heard the trade name Vercon Vercon S uh, very effective disinfecting agent um, going to be a, a, a highly recommended material for the disinfection of anything from the very small flock to the very large commercial type operations. Um, so oxidizing agents, the other that you'll probably find pretty uh, readily is going to be the phenols. <clears throat> Those are things like One Stroke Environ, One Stroke Environ, Phenotech and Tectrol. These different 
compounds are going to be very effective in the presence of organic material. So if it's a very dirty, dusty, poopy kind of situation, one of these is probably going to be a really good bet. Um, it's stable. It's non-corrosive. It's a, it's a really good thing overall. Um, the one warning on those phenols is that there is some potential toxicity to uh, cats and to pigs. So be really careful in a mixed animal, mixed livestock type of setup. So, um, okay. yeah. Thanks for that, Andy. And, and I will, I'll make note of some of these resources that we're going to have available here when we get to the end of the uh, uh, session here as we get towards the end of our time and some of the things we talked about where they're going to be housed. Um, am I to understand also that, uh, and this is to either of you, um, that uh, after about 30 to 60 days after being uh, getting rid of all your birds and depopulating and cleaning and what have you, USDA will then work with you again about how and when you can repopulate. But I think it's 30 to 60 days, but it varies. Is that right, Ken? Yeah, it'll, it'll vary depending upon the speed at which they do this, the speed at which you... Um you know, depopulate and the speed at which you clean everything up. I know it takes time, and and uh, they do what is called releasing the premise. In other words, when they when they say that you you have been released, they've released their quarantine, and you are free to go ahead and repopulate uh, your flock. And so it, it's gonna it's gonna vary, but that's that's probably a, a pretty good guess right in there. Okay, so for um uh, for for the three of us here, and we might have some concluding thoughts here as we get to the end of our time. Uh, one thing that I will mention on this is that uh, U of I Extension uh, and our uh, colleagues on uh, on campus are, are working with us to put all these resources together, fact sheets, uh, news releases. Uh, we'll we'll put up a list of some of these uh, disinfectants and things like that. The recording of this session is going to also be on the Small Farms website. And the easiest way for you to get eventually to all of these resources is just to go into Google and type in Illinois Small Farms Poultry. And you will find all of this information and the links to it. And that's the easiest way to get to all of these various documents. So that will be happening very quickly here uh, from our side with it. So uh, uh, Andy and, and Ken, uh, some concluding thoughts here that you want people to walk away with? Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll start here a little bit. Um, so we're, we're still having outbreaks, at least in a commercial industry, as of today. Uh, we don't know how long that's going to happen. Um, and going forward here, we're hope we're at the end of uh, the seriousness, at least for now, maybe until until fall. Um, but I think it's 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 important for uh, you know small flock poultry producers, uh, whether your pasture, organic backyard or whatever, just to be mindful and diligent on your your biosecurity practices. Um, watch watch your poultry closely. Um, watch for some of the signs that we have talked about here today, um, and then um, you know take necessary steps uh, if it comes to that, and of course take necessary steps to limit your risk uh, of of this problem. And as we said in the beginning, I don't think it's uh, you know one and done right here. I, I think it's uh, we'll we'll uh, continue to have these kind of things, uh, events, problems with HPAI going forward in the next maybe four or five years. So Andy? All right, so to just build on that, uh, first off, again, I'm sorry that this is an issue for you backyard folks. I know that sometimes your birds can almost be like pets and like family, um, but the good side of the message today is that it has not been located or confirmed in Illinois at this point. Um, so it is a good thing that we are still spatially separated from the outbreak and we need to take steps to make sure we stay that way. So really consider strongly where you could end up getting yourself exposed to um, high path AI virus materials that you can potentially stay away from. Stay away from other poultry farms, stay away from hatcheries, do your best not to import <clears throat> this problematic pathogen into Illinois as much as you possibly can. So we don't have it. Do figure out, uh, look online at what the, the 
pictures that we've provided regarding what the symptoms look like, know how to identify those symptoms. Do not fear if you have it. You do need to get rid of those birds that have high path AI so they are not a vector to the rest of the commercial industry, costing people potentially millions of dollars. Um, so be very aware of what it looks like when you get it. If you do get it, get rid of it in the appropriate way. Call your vet, call the numbers that Ken provided, make sure that your flock is depopulated, clean and disinfect appropriately, and start from scratch, start fresh um, over again in 30 to 60 days. Okay, with that, um, I think that'll conclude our session here today and be looking uh, in various um, uh, uh, newspapers and trade magazines and things like that. We'll have a lot of information out there about resources we have. And please visit uh, Illinois Small Farms Poultry. Uh, Google that and uh, we'll get, you can get to all the resources. want to thank everybody for being on today. Thank you to the speakers, and thank you for all of our help from the campus people putting the tech side of this together. To all of you growers out there, um, I hope you gained some useful information, and uh, hopefully we answered most of the questions you might have. Uh, it's something, this is something that we just unfortunately have to deal with, and there's a straightforward way to do it. And uh, with anything in agriculture, we'll deal with it and, and go on and, and have uh, productive flocks out there. So with that, uh, we're going to sign off. And everybody, uh, I wish you all good luck with your flocks.